everybody ready? Oh. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City Council meeting. If you'd please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for our statement of values. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As we gather, we humbly seek blessings upon this meeting. May we act with the strength, courage, and will to perform our obligations and duties to our people with justice to all. Let us seek wisdom so that we may act in the best interest of our people, our neighbors, and our country. All this we ask so that we may serve our community with fairness and respect, putting their needs before all. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, uh, City Clerk, roll call. Councilmember Mahan. Here. O'Neill. Present. Davis. Here. Watanabe. Present. Colstad. Here. And Mayor Gilmore. Here. And if I may please read the AB 23 yes. announcement that members of the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, Sports and Open Space Authority, and Housing Authority are entitled to receive $30 for each attended meeting. And also the Statement of Behavioral Standards. The City of Santa Clara has adopted a code of ethics and values and behavioral standards for public meetings to promote and maintain the highest levels of conduct. This includes mutual respect, robust discussion, and allowing city business to be done in an efficient and consistent manner. Please note that, as the presiding officer, the mayor's direction in matters of process and decorum should be followed, and that use of the gavel indicates all conversations must conclude and everyone in attendance should come to order and attention. Welcome, and thank you for your participation. Thank you, City Clerk. Uh, next, we have re reports of action taken in closed session, City Attorney. Uh, Council took no reportable actions in closed session. Thank you, City Attorney. Uh, next item, we have continuance as and exceptions. Vice Mayor? Yes, uh, yes, Mayor. I would like to uh, make a motion that we move up uh, from the consent calendar item two S to be heard under a special order of business this evening, please. So it would be the last special order of business after the five that we have. So yes. that's item 2S, that's action on the request from Santa Clara Pal Gal softball team for reimbursement of eligible expenses from the championship team fund. Okay, there is a motion. Is there second. a second? Motion second to move that item up. Any discussion? Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously. So that item will be heard uh, after 1E, e, so it'll be 1F. Okay. So we have a few special orders of business this evening. It's a very exciting evening. Uh, the first we have is the recognition of outgoing DARE officer Stephanie Knight. Is Stephanie here in the audience? Oh, she's way back. Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind coming forward so when we talk about you, everybody can take a look at you. Love to do this on purpose. All right, so some of you may recognize Officer Knight, but for tonight's special order of business, the City Council would like to recognize outgoing DARE officer Stephanie Knight for her work on the Santa Clara's DARE program. The Santa Clara Police Department began teaching the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program in 1995. Now Santa Clara's D.A.R.E. program is taught at 17 public and private schools in the city of Santa Clara. Officer Stephanie Knight has worked in the Santa Clara Police Department Community Services Unit since August 2013 and has taught the D.A.R.E. program since August 2014. As a DARE officer, Officer Knight was responsible for active shooter training, drills for all schools, kindergarten presentations, career fairs, parent teacher association, PTA presentations, cyber bullying presentations, and managing the police department booth at all major city events. She coordinated the Wilcox High Schools and the Santa Clara High Schools Every 15 Minutes program. Over a course of a three-year period, Officer Knight has taught 57 10-week 5th grade D.A.R.E. classes and 8 3-week 7th grade D.A.R.E. classes. 
So in recognition of Officer Knight's work with the Santa Clara Police Department as a DARE officer and her dedication to teaching Santa Clara's youth, we would like to present uh, her with their certificate of special mayoral recognition. So um, just on a personal note, I have attended many DARE graduations in Santa Clara over the last few years, and Officer Knight has presided over many of them. And I just wanted to say that um, she, is, uh, she connects extremely well with our fifth graders and seventh graders here in Santa Clara and teaching them lifelong skills for uh, drug resistance, drug and alcohol resistance, cyber bullying, bullying, uh, stress management, um, t tobacco abuse, all the types of life lessons that are, especially our fifth graders, um, they're at the right age to receive this type of information. And she connects so well with the, with the students in our community. And I have admired her and the, the actual, um, She's very detail-oriented, doesn't leave a single detail to, to anyone's uh, imagination. She takes care of everything, and she has a, such a special connection with the youth in our community. I know that the things that she has taught our youth in Santa Clara, they are going to remember for the rest of their lives, and they're going to use the tools that she has given them uh, the rest of their lives in many, many different situations. Um, she's... Uh, they're a testament to her wonderful work in the fifth grade uh, communities uh, here at our schools in Santa Clara. And so we want to take the time to honor um, Officer Knight for her good work. And I wish you could be in that program another four years. Maybe you can take a year off. Is Chief here? Oh, okay. <laughs> and and she needs to go back because she really does a phenomenal job. So. Um, Chief Sellers, if you'd like to come up and uh, say a few words about Officer Knight. Oh, no, no, it's okay. It's okay, Stephanie. <laughs> You're right. Good. Well, first of all, Mayor and Council, I just, again, as of like last night, I just want to thank you very much for recognizing our DARE program, and especially Officer Knight for all of her uh, service that she's provided to the city. But you're absolutely right. She has formed a connection with our fifth and seventh graders, which is amazing, especially when you see her interacting with them, especially at the Art and Wine Festival. And people who have graduated over the last four years through the DARE program, they come up to her and, and talk to her and catch up, and it's an absolutely wonderful program. I'm so happy she's uh, still with us and going to back yes, into patrol. unlike yesterday. Yes, yes. exactly, uh -huh. back in patrol. And one other thing, she is an exceptional crime scene investigator, she, too. She does all of our crime scene work which is very much appreciated, and she's going to continue that in patrol. And I just, uh, again, want to thank her very much for her years of service in the D.A.R.E. program, and I know she'll continue to build that relationship with our community as she moves forward. So congratulations. Thank you. Before you speak, uh, Vice Mayor Watanabe. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Officer Knight, for, for your service to the D.A.R.E. program. I just have to add one comment because the mayor mentioned about how meticulous and precise you are, and, and I just have to share about how when we got our invites for our calendars, we they were always 15 minutes. We were always scheduled to be there 15 minutes ahead, and, and we would get there and thinking that we had to be there at 8.45, but actually it was starting at 9 o'clock, and we'd all be standing around like, why are we all here? So all I can say is everybody's going to be late going forward, okay? So, but no, it was a wonderful thing that, that you did to make sure that we were all there on time because it was a very important program. And when you saw those students and especially all the parents and grandparents that came to support, you know, their, their students, it was wonderful. So it showed just how much it meant to the families as well as the students. So thank you for your dedication to the program. And we didn't catch on till a later that she was doing that to us. <laughs> We finally caught on. Uh, Officer Knight, would you like to say a few words? Uh, yeah. Thank you for all of your support and with the D.A.R.E. program. And it really meant a lot to the kids when I got to tell them, your VIP guests are going to be the mayor's office, the city council members. It's going to be the chief's office, like all my bosses. And the kids were always so amazing. Like, they want to come to see us? I'm like, yes. So it just I think it just helped really establish a better bond with the kids and then for their parents to see all of you guys there and all of your support. So thank you very much for supporting that program. I'm really gonna miss it, so I just gotta wait 18 months before I can put back in. So. Yay. Oh. Yay. I do, um, I do wanna do it again, so. Yeah. Wonderful, so if you could please join us in chief, if you have your staff here that would like to join us up here for a photo. 
you like to introduce him? Yes. Okay, our next uh, special order of business is recognition of Intel's 50th anniversary. And I believe we have Rita Holiday here. Hi, Rita, if you'd like to come up. Welcome. Thank you. So, as a special order of business this evening, Santa Clara is recognizing Intel Corporation's 50th anniversary. It's hard to believe it's been 50 years. Uh, Intel Corporation was founded by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore on July 18, 1968. Tomorrow, Intel will celebrate 50 years of leading technological innovation and advancements. The technology of Intel has enabled the world to work wirelessly anytime and anywhere, receive, send, and store data faster, obtain better medical care, and explore outer space. Looking back on the past five decades, Intel has been at the forefront of driving innovation and has made remarkable impact in the technology industry and in Santa Clara and Silicon Valley. At this time, I'd like uh, to invite Intel's Community Engagement Manager, Rita Holiday, uh, to give us a few words of wisdom about Intel. So welcome, Rita. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members and all the wonderful people of the community. Um, it's been a pleasure for Intel to be part of this community. And um, I am, we're just overwhelmed with that the city wanted to recognize us because we're here because you let us be um, who we need to be. And we hope that we're here another 50 years. So thank you so much. OK, thank you. But don't go anywhere yet oh. because now. <laughs> I'd like to invite Congressman Ro Khanna's District Director, Chris Moylan, up to the podium. He has a few words to say. Welcome, Chris. Good to see you all again, Council nice Members. To see you. Uh, I, on behalf of Congressman Khanna, I'd also like to give you this lovely certificate uh, <laughs> uh, in, in congratulation for Intel's 50th anniversary. Like most people around here, uh, I've been a customer many times. I have many friends who work for the, co the company and have know what Moore's Law is. And you know, th this company has, has really made a huge difference, not just making products that, and convincing people that they need them, but making things that really people did need and that have really enabled a huge amount of the technology that drives this whole valley. And so um, it's not only one of the great Santa Clara companies, it's, a, it's one of the great world companies. And so on behalf of the congressman, Here's a congratulatory Thank you so much. So um, when we talk about Santa Clara and the uh, corporate headquarters that we have in Santa Clara, Intel is always the first one we always list in Santa Clara. We're very incredibly proud of having uh, Intel, such a wonderful company here in the city. And so on behalf of the council, I'd like to present you with um, 50th anniversary proclamation uh, to for you to accept on behalf of Intel. And there were so many things that Intel has accomplished. We have the tiniest little writing on here. I've never seen anything like this. It is just jam-packed with information. 
and recognition for such a wonderful company. So Rita, if you'd like to join us up front, we'd love to take a, a photo with you. Oh, Chris. Her phone first, one, two, three, and one, two, three, one. Camera. More. Okay, our next uh, special order of business. I'm excited to recognize Vesalia Tarla, Tarla Vajula as the California recipient of the Stockholm Junior Water Prize. So Vesalia, if you'd like to come forward so everyone can take a look at you as well. Oh, can you get up there with all that medals. hardware? Yeah. Hanging all those medals? It's heavy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> So I want to thank um, Vice Mayor Watanabe for um, inviting Vasalia to come forward here. So I want to talk a little bit about the special awards that she has won. So the Stockholm Junior Water Prize is considered the world's most prestigious award presented to a high school student for a water research project. The California Water Environment Association previously announced that Ms. Tala Vajula, I'm so sorry if I say it wrong, from Wilcox High School in Santa Clara, California, represented the state of California at the national competition for the third time, June 15th through 17th, 2018, at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Her project was titled Irrigation Water Usage Efficiency Improvement by Modification of Root Zone Soil Properties Using Carbon Sequestrant. Right? Did you all sequestration? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> sequestration. I I knew that. <laughs> the national winner will represent the United States at the international competition held during World Water Week in Stockholm in late August. At this time, I'd like to invite Gary Welling, our director of water and sewer utilities, to speak and introduce uh, her and her family. So, Gary, if you'd like to come forward, please. Well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Vishella and her father, uh, Sai, and mother, Isabella. Sai, would you like to come up, please, as well? <laughs> come, on, come on, mom and dad. Um, I had a few minutes here to chat with Vishella, a very, very impressive young lady, uh, local, local high school student, as you mentioned. Uh, I'll mention a couple other things that she's working on and she's been involved with. Um, she was one of 10 finalists for the Clean Tech International Competition on Climate Change held recently in Stony Brook University in Long Island, New York. Uh, and if that wasn't impressive enough, she's a finalist in the Think MIT scholarship program, presenting her science project titled Smart Scheduling of Irrigation Using Weather Sensor Data. Um, she was also elected chairperson of the Santa Clara Valley Water District Youth Commission, which is doing public education, increasing communities awareness of water. So she's interested in a career in STEM, and uh, I think it'd be appropriate if you want to talk a little bit about your project. Yes, yeah. please. Yes. Great. Um, so I've actually been working on my project for about three years. So the first year that I worked on my project, I worked to improve subsurface irrigation. I did this by creating a topsoil bed made up of perlite and peat moss. And I was able to save about 25% of water with this method. 
Um, the second year, I actually worked on creating my own version um, instead of using subsurface irrigation, which is very expensive. So I did this by um, using the gravity-fed drip method, and I created my own insert. And what I did is I let water infiltrate all the way down to the root zone, and I kept that topsoil bed to continue reducing evaporation loss. The third year, which is this year, I created the PCL, or the percolation control layer. And what I did is I amended it with 33% charcoal. So the PCL layer was supposed to reduce percolation loss, which is water loss down to gravity, um, down to groundwater due to gravity. Um, but it also did three other things. So it did the percolation, like I said. It also um, did carbon sequestration, which is um, instead of letting CO2 um, or carbon oxidize and go into the atmosphere and you know become greenhouse gases, which really <laughs> destroys our atmosphere, um, it puts carbon below the surface. Um, and then it also increased the plant yield and also um, increased the root health of the plants that I planted. And all in all, um, the big takeaway from my project is that with 50% less water, I had a 50% higher crop yield. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Does the council have any questions on that? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none. <laughs> Vice Mayor Watanabe, oh, you thank have a few things to say about thank this you, incredible young lady? Yes, yeah, she is a very incredible young lady. I first became, uh, I was introduced to Vasala when she was actually in Sister Cities, and oh. she traveled to Coimbra, Portugal, and actually while she was there with the chaperone, uh, Ruth Lemon, who's also here tonight, uh, Vasala actually had to uh, participate in a uh, online interview uh, through Skype yeah. uh, as part of the competition. So, uh, I mean, she never let an opportunity go by to be able to just keep this project moving forward. And I think it just shows her dedication and commitment. And I think you, what you're studying and what these projects, you know, that you continue to evolve are, are very timely. And, and I think going forward, uh, I, I don't think you'll ever have a problem getting a job, especially here in <laughs> California. So <laughs> congratulations, Vasala. Thank you for your dedication. And I'm so glad that you're on the, uh, the uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District Youth Commission as well. I know that you'll make a big contribution there as well. And, and going forward, I have no doubt that you have a very bright future. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, for introducing this incredible young lady to the city of Santa Clara. So we'd like you to join us, Vasala, up front here with your parents, uh, both of you, and we'd love to present you with this special mayoral recognition and to take a photo with you and your family. Yep, Sherry. Teresa, you're <laughs> okay. We've got three cameras, so this one's going to be one, two. Hard to top that one. Okay. <laughs> Woo. Okay, our next uh, special order of business is our proclamations of Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month. 
So as a special order of business this evening, I'd like to announce that Muslim Awareness and Appreciation Month is next month in August. And joining us this evening, we have Congressman Ro Khanna's District Director, Chris Moylan. You haven't left yet, Chris, have you? Who will join <laughs> us in honoring Muslim Aware Awareness and Appreciation Month. We also have representatives from both MCA, the Muslim Community Association, and CARE joining us this evening. And so Muslim Awareness and Appreciation Month honors generations of Muslim Americans for their many social, cultural, and economic contributions to our city of Santa Clara, state, and across the country. At this time, I'd like to invite MCA President Kamal Khoratim up to the podium, please. if you'd like to come to the front here, so to make sure you're, you're ready. Uh, and if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, dear Mayor Gilmore, uh, City Council members, guests, and friends, uh, as a country, I need my glasses, yeah. that's why. <laughs> as a country, we live in, in somber times where stereotypes is replaced in dialogues and where bridges are being replaced with walls Children are being separated from their biological parents. Citizens, permanent residents, and visitors are banned from entering the country for no other reason than th their place of birth or their faith. We live at a time where social and family values are being compromised and the true American way of life is being challenged. Why adversity is attempting to hijack our lives, we, the Muslims of Santa Clara, were committed to serving our city. As law-abiding citizens, we are committed to uphold our social obligations and to safeguard our rights and the rights of every Santa Clara. On behalf of the thousands of Muslims who reside in Santa Clara, and on behalf of thousands from all corners of the Bay Area who attend services at the MCA, we thank Mayor Gilmore and the esteemed city council members for recognizing August 2018 as the Muslim Appreci Appreciation and Awareness Month. We as Santa Clarans are honored and ecstatic by this recognition. Thank you, Santa Clara. Thank you, Kamal. And if you'd like to just stay close. Um, so next, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, next, I'd like to invite CARES uh, Government Relations Coordinator, Samina Usman. Hi. Who's well, very familiar to all of us at the podium. <laughs> Welcome, Samina. No, I wanted to thank you very much. I wanted to thank the mayor and council uh, for recognizing Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month. I mean, Muslims have been part of the founding of this country, of the building of this country. Uh, we've been part of the, the fabric. I mean, you know, whether it be, um, you know, we're your lawyers, we're your activists, we are your uh, doctors. I mean, we have been, been part of um, this community, you know, for many decades as well. And so, um, you know, we're honored to be receiving uh, this proclamation and this recognition from the City Council, especially when we have, I mean, we've been having so much um, discord in this country, especially in the past couple years and definitely in this past year. And we're hearing messages from, um, you know, the, the very highest office of our country that have been very negative and very damaging. And you have a, a tra Muslim travel ban, which has separated numerous families, um, you know, main, and, and it, it's, it is a Muslim travel ban. And so this is um, why it's it's crucial for our elected officials to stand firm with the Muslim community, to show their sh support, to show their solidarity. And so we're, we're truly appreciated of, of this. So thank you. Thank you, Samina. And, and I'd like also to thank uh, Chief Sellers and the entire Santa Clara Police Department for standing firm in support of the rights of all the Santa Clarans, including the Muslims here. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to say the Muslim Community Association has been a huge part of Santa Clara, as was mentioned, for, for many decades. And what I really um, find heartening is that over the years, through the open houses at the, at the MCA and others, it's just, I, I see every year more and more uh, Santa Clara residents coming, and you've opened the doors at the Muslim Community Association to the whole community, and, and we're part of a huge family here in Santa Clara, and the Muslim Community, community Association is a part of the huge family here in Santa Clara. We consider you 
one of our own. So um, you're our neighbors, our friends, our families, and everything. So it's an honor to, to honor you for everything that you do and to let you know that you have the support of all our community and to thank the chief also for all the, um, the police, public safety support. Um, that is that is needed. So I'd like to ask uh, Chris Moylan. He would like to uh, present a few certificates on behalf of Congressman Kana. Yes, thank you. Uh, the points about the climate in which we're living are very well taken. Uh, and the point that our elected officials have to stand up for us is very well taken. And you see, obviously, your city officials are standing up in favor of peace and community. And I know that there have been some problems with the executive branch of the federal government and the judicial branch that upheld the action of the executive branch. But you have friends in the legislative branch, I can at least <laughs> say. And I'm here to represent one of them, Congressman Khanna, and I have a certificate for the MCA, and I have a certificate for CARE. And on behalf of the Congressman, I'd like to echo the mayor's words that we stand behind anyone who is working for peace, and working for us all to get along. Right? We don't need these people from some higher level of government to come into our communities and <laughs> mess things up for us. And while the fight continues at that highest level of government to undo or fix things that we know to be wrong, at least here, we know we all do our best to make a safe space for all of each other. So on behalf of the Congressman, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Chris. So now on the half of the City Council, we'd like to present both MCA and CARE with City Proclamations in honor of August as Muslim Awareness and Appreciation Month. And if you'd like to please come forward. Is it possible for us to get uh, the community members who have come out today as well to join us for this picture? Okay, come thank you. <laughs> we can get the community so members to come out. <laughs> Okay, that works. Uh oh. <laughs> that, that's probably that. You can know? Okay. It works if you want to get up there, I think. Uh, Hassan. Got it. Got it. Okay, so this one first. Oh, there's so many. Oh, 
the joint. No, just a little water spill. Um, oh. Two up to one up. No, we got a cultural thing. Oh, what's that? A little water spill. Oh, that's okay. We don't care. I don't make sense. Okay. Am I water spill? Is water spill. Oh, okay. okay, the next item we have is the Cultural Commission presentation of upcoming events in August and September. Woohoo, Debbie. Debbie is here Hi. to tell us about our <laughs> chair of the Cultural Commission. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is my first time. Do I press the uh, center or the. She's going to tell us all about uh, what fun we're going to have this. in August and okay. September. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, um, I was named the chair of the Cultural Commission for the current fiscal year. It's really my honor to be here tonight. Uh, this first slide talks about uh, what we do and how to find us. Uh, we are on the Santa Clara uh, CA.gov webpage as long uh, as, uh, as uh, in addition, we have our own Facebook page at Cultural Commission. So we host um, events throughout the year to celebrate the diversity and invite every citizen of Santa Clara to come enjoy a free concert or other kind of event, um, including concerts in the park that are underway right now, Friday Night Live, a commemorative series, art in public spaces, and community mixers. I just want to mention that last Friday at the uh, uh, concert in the park, Orchestra uh, Latin Heat was there and we had well over 500 people. It was wonderful to see so many people turn out and really a big celebration of our community. Also, if anybody would like to volunteer to be a friend of the Cultural Commission, you can find us on the residence uh, slash volunteer page. So for, uh, actually this should say July 2018 through June 2019, my apologies, uh, we have Loretta Beavers, Harbir Bhatia, Candy Diaz, Niha Mather, uh, Louis Samara, myself, and our newly appointed commissioner, Jonathan Marinaro, uh, on the commission. And uh, Louis Samara was selected as vice chair this year. We have as our staff liaisons, Kimberly Castro and Maureen Zan Piracci. I hope I pronounced that name right. I, I'm just getting to know her. And then, as you mentioned, August is the Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month. The upcoming concerts in the park that we have include um, Sunday, July 22nd, uh, we have the Leertones, which is a big band uh, group, which is going to be really fun. I love big band music myself. And in case people weren't aware, we do have food and shaved ice available now at the concerts in the park. That was a big hit. Then on Friday, July 27th, we have California Groove, which is a, a rock, more current uh, like, uh, Artists such as Lady Gaga, Beyonce, and Bruno Mars are covered. And then Friday, August 3rd, we have our Franklin Street Dance, our annual Franklin Street Dance, and we hope everybody comes out for that. It's going to be a full day with food vendors, beer and wine, children's activities, interactive art, and much more, as, long as, every, as well as everybody's favorites, the hitmen. So that is from 6.30 to 9 p.m. at Franklin Square. And then we also have a few more concerts in the park in August. The Funky Souls on Sunday, August 12th from 2.30 to 4, and the House Rockers on Friday, August 17th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. That's a full summer of activities it and sure fun. Is. Thank yes. you so much for presenting that. Is there any questions from the council? Seeing none, thank you, and congratulations on your chairmanship. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the item that we have moved forward, and that is the item on, I'm trying to find it here. Okay, the action on the request from Santa Clara Pal Gal Softball for reimbursement of eligible expenses from the championship team fund. So, um, is anyone going to make uh, Vice Mayor Watanabe? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I believe uh, there the two coaches are here. Is, it, is Coach Todd and uh, Coach Yi Wu would like to come and talk about all the excitement in San Diego this weekend? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, 
most of the team has returned uh, from this weekend's championship state games down in Santa Cla or in San Diego. Um, some are still making their way here, and they're uh, a little disappointed they couldn't make it to the meeting tonight. Um, but about a month ago, both the 10U Santa Clara Sparks uh, softball team and the 12U Santa Clara Sparks team uh, qualified at the NorCal qualifier at Twin Creeks. The 10U girls placed second in the in the Northern California division. The 12U placed third, qualifying them to play in the Junior Olympic State Games down in San Diego. And upon returning, the 10U girls have placed higher than any 10U team in Santa Clara over the past decade, placing fifth as the highest ranking Northern California team. The 12U girls uh, did what no Santa Clara PAL team has done in over 30 years, and that is win the state championship. So both teams have now returned with hardware and ha were the only uh, uh, organization to have two teams make it to the top five uh, down in San Diego. Santa Clara should be very proud of all the girls who went down there. We are. Take the motion. And we've asked them to all to come on uh, August 21st mm -hmm. under special order of business so we can properly honor them for their wonderful achievements. Um, we're very, very proud of them. Can, can uh, we go ahead Vice and Mayor Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Can we go ahead and make the, the motion now to, uh, they had a, um, uh, they had applied for uh, travel reimbursement as, par as part of, uh, to help them with their, their trip to San Diego. And if it's okay, I'd like to go ahead and just make the motion to approve the uh, Santa Clara Pal Gal softball, uh, softball's request for reimbursement of $2,514 for eligible expenses subject to audit from the championship team fund for participation in the 2018 California State Games USA Softball Sea Region 14 championship tournament in San Diego, California. Um, there's a motion and a second. Any questions from the council? All right. Any questions from the public? Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously. Congratulations, and we'll see you on August 21st. Thank you, council. Congratulations, ladies. <laughs> Did you have something else to say? Did someone want to say something? <laughs> no. Okay. You want it? Uh, you want to take it back? Is that it? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Okay. Um, August twenty first. We expect you to come up and speak, ladies. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Next item we have on the agenda is the consent calendar. All items are approved with one uh, motion, unless there's an item pulled for discussion. Are there any items from the consent calendar? Any council members want to pull any items for discussion? Okay, not seeing any members of the public. Uh, item 2L, please. 2L, okay. That's action on the appropriation of asset forfeiture funds for fiscal year 2018-19. So we'll pull item 2L, yes please. And I'd like to pull item 2I. And your 2I. Okay. And 2I is action on adoption of ordinance of assigning professional responsibilities from the elected city clerk to the assistant city clerk and setting the salary of the elected city clerk commensurate with the stipend and benefits of a council member any other member of the public wanting to pull anything okay approve balance of consent is there calendar. there's a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar is there a second a motion and second to approve items that have not been pulled for discussion uh, any member of the council, member of the public? Okay, please register your vote on the consent calendar. And that passes unanimously. Okay, let's find where this consent calendar ends here. It's very long today. Okay, next is public presentations. So are there any... Public presentations, let me see here. I don't have any speaker cards, none. Okay, is there any member of the public 
Any member of public would like to speak on anything that's not on the agenda? Hello there, um, Anthony Becker. I see that a lot of the people from Reclaiming Downtown had left already, but I'm going to do this for them. Uh, Reclaiming Downtown has restored a vision that had once been lost. They had made us all fall in love with our city again, and we are so rich with our history. These grand efforts by Dan, Rod, Mary, Don, and Co. are not to go unnoticed. They have been the ground troops of this starting, the starting this movement. While I'm here to say, we need more. We need more to get that momentum out in the streets and to the people. Instead of surveys, instead of building up how many people we can be a part of on Facebook, we need to take it further, a step ahead, and take this to the people. The city has funds for two ballot measures. The first, the cannabis tax, that should be used to sell debts and not create any more. But at the same time, we need to have a ballot measure that will be for a brand new downtown. A ballot measure that will give us a lot of options. It needs a precise plan and the support of the people. Tonight, the Franklin Street easement was a positive direction. I believe, I know most of you may disagree from the Reclaiming Downtown group that just getting this piece is not enough, but it is a piece for our dream. Remember, this is a game of Monopoly, not a game of Jenga. If we leave this easement, if we do not take this easement, which we already did as of this now, we have now the bargaining chip and are finally starting the process to build this. If you want Park Central land, then the city should buy the whole thing from the landowners like Prometheus for, to create our downtown. Piece by piece, brick by brick, we shall achieve our downtown. A ballot initiative would generate the funds through fees associated to the new project developments by businesses, traffic mitigation fees, and maybe even the cannabis funds, if that is even an option. Reclaiming our dark town started this fire, and now I would, like to, I would hope to see this movement stand in front of stores, parks, and a blitzkrieg of nothing but registered voters and residents signing this to put forward a pipe dream that finally will make it a reality here in Santa Clara. I would be the first and proud signature on that list if I have the option to be on there, as well as I bet some council members would even like to sign that too for a ballot measure. No one can deny the voters' voice. No one can deny a law. If they could bulldoze our downtown in 68, we can surely rebuild it in the foreseeable future. If you build it, they will come, they said and feel the dreams. I believe that's the truth. So the, I believe we are hungry, and it's time to make it happen. This is the Santa Clara Renaissance, so let's strike while that iron is hot. This is Santa Clara, the center of what's possible. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public? Please come forward. OK, seeing none, the next items we have are uh, consent items pulled for discussion. And the first uh, is 2I, that Hassan, or Anthony, please come back. The item on the city, uh, assistant city clerk. Yes. All right, I'm doing this for the record. Um, so our city attorney has stated that if the judge picks seven districts in violation, it violates our charter. So does six districts, two, two districts, so on. This, yet this ruling will make us change our laws. So it's either courts or the people that change the laws or the rules. Examples could be like Prop 8. The voters said no back in 2008 to gay marriage. The courts rejected that. So why, are we putting a ballot why aren't we putting a ballot measure forward to amend this, to even amend the just the job title? Therefore, I go to the city council deems it to be Interest of the City of Santa Clara to formally assign the professional responsibilities of City Clerk. Therefore, I believe the voters have the best interest to decide this. We just have to change the job description and amend the charter. At the same time, the commencing of the July 9th commission uh, by the Civil Service Commission to set the salary, um, that is a violation of Measure O, I believe, because it only states that City Council and Mayor salaries are in there. That, we, that will also need to be amended, too, if we do this. And therefore, um, it is described now as an ordinance, which I believe if ordinances are on there, they are usually amended by electors or by ballot. So I question, is this a misuse of power? Because we're not separating the two powers. Um, it distinctly states in our charter that we do need to separate them, and it does need to be an elected position. 
that if we do amend, we do need to amend it in some way or form. Changing, changing it requires a, a charter vote by the people. So I ask, are we intentionally misinterpreting the charter or are we setting ourselves up for another lawsuit because we're lacking the voter input on changing a description of an elected official? Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments on that before I ask the clerk or city attorney? Was it, we're not changing the city clerk or the charter requirements for the city clerk? City attorney? Uh, the charter provision that uh, lists the duties of the city clerk also has at the end of it an ability for the council to assign those duties to other members uh, of the uh, other employees of the city, and that's exactly what the ordinance does. It assigns um, most of the um, record keeping type functions of the city clerk to uh, the assistant city clerk in accordance with the charter provisions. So there, it's not necessary for a charter change? We're not violating the charter? No, it's consistent with the charter. I mean, the ordinance was written to be consistent with the charter. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Councilmember Mayhan. Um, it's no surprise. I've been against this all along. I think it's an end run around our charter. I understand it meets the letter of the law, but there's such a thing as the spirit of the law, and we've had an elected city clerk since we've had our charter. And the city clerk is our election officer. I think it's very important that that office be independent, be objective, be answerable to the electorate of the city of Santa Clara. So I'm not going to support this motion. City attorney. I just wanted to point out that the, uh, the ordinance does not assign the, the elections officer duties of the city clerk to the assistant city clerk. So the elected officer will continue to be the elections officer. The elected city clerk will continue to be the elections officer of the city under the ordinance. I thought, okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member O'Neill. Uh, yes, I just wanted to kind of follow on to the city attorney's comments. Um, you know, uh, and we have had some study sessions. We've had several meetings about this. And you know what I've observed over the years is that um, the functions of a city clerk have gotten a lot more complicated, and uh, it's it's a, a very dedicated profession now. Uh, and it, it, we've had you know it, it's we've been fortunate that we've gotten some of the people that we've gotten that have been elected. But, it, you know, it's very conceivable to ha have somebody be elected that absolutely has no experience in, in, this, in this particular professional field, and it makes it more difficult for those duties to be carried out in a professional manner. And so when I, you know, I think when we listened to the public, we heard that people didn't want to have a totally, um, you know, um, appointed, say, civil service or, you know, appointed uh, city clerk, and so the, what the people said in those the, that did come and the, the correspondence that we received is that they wanted to make sure that the elections were run in an independent manner, and so that's why we looked at as an example, um, since there aren't there are some, but there but the preponderance of cities uh, in California have an appointed city clerk, but say our um, our. Uh, city Morgan Hill in our county that does have an elected city clerk, what that city clerk does is focus on running the elections in an independent and, uh, manner. And so I myself think that that's the most, um, in terms of needing the independence, that's the most important portion of what the city clerk does. And, you know, and I would think that, you know, maybe some of this will get into um, when we have that person overseeing some of the ethics issues that go on with the campaigns and those types of issues. And so that's what I want, you know, what, what I would like to see the city clerk function on and having all the things like the record keeping, the systems management and all that be in the hands of somebody who's a professional in that field. So I will be supporting the, the ordinance. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we had uh, actually a dinner this evening with the Civil Service Commission and the issue of uh, salary setting uh, 
came up uh, under um, and discussion about Measure O, and it was uh, it was um, uh, stated that uh, Measure O, along with setting the compensation rates for uh, the mayor and city council members, does include the city clerk. Uh, so, um, just to clarify that. Um, question and I would like to go ahead and uh, make a motion to uh, act on uh, the uh, action on adoption of ordinance number eight, 1983 assigning professional responsibilities from the elected city clerk to the assistant city clerk and setting the salary of the elected city clerk commensurate with the stipend and benefits of council members. Second. So a motion and a second. Any other council comments? Any comments from the public? Please register your vote. And that passes on a five to one. Thank you. So the next item, hold 2I, 2L. Mr. Hagag, I believe you pulled that item on the asset seizure, seizure funds. Yes, sir. Hassan Hagag here. Um, it was May 24th, uh, May 24th, two years ago, um, which I came and spoke um, in front of you all about <clears throat> an item on the agenda, which is almost identical to the item tonight on this agenda about civil asset forfeiture. At the time, you guys were appropriating $93,500. That number this year has gone up to almost $124,000 or $123,000. Um, I have nothing against, you know, allocating the funds to um, the different needs of the police department. I think that is phenomenal. I think for those who don't know what civil asset forfeiture is, it's basically if the police stop you for any, you know, maybe even a routine traffic stop and you have an amount of cash on you and they, for whatever reason, suspect that it may be in the, in the, in the pursuit of a criminal activity, they can seize that cash or any assets that you have, maybe even a vehicle. And that vehicle or that cash is now in, belongs to the, to the city or belongs to the municipality. Um, so um, since I spoke in two years ago, the uh, state, the Senate, state Senate has passed a 443, Senate Bill 443, which further restricts um, how, so, uh, um, uh, assets can be seized by law enforcement in California. My request to you tonight is the same request I made two years ago. And that is, can, or, or it's a request for the city to establish citizen oversight on any assets that are seized by our police department. It's not that I don't distrust them. It's not that I distrust them. It's just that if you are somebody who gets your assets seized, it is a legal nightmare to be able to get it back, and a lot of times it's just not worth it. So if you get, you know, if a thousand dollars get taken from you, it costs more for you to try to get that back through the legal system than it is for you just to let it go. And so what I would request is for Santa Clara to take a leadership position on this and to establish citizen oversight for any funds that are seized through civil asset forfeiture. And then if the fund is legitimate in terms of it needing to be, have been seized, then we can allocate it to these sort of programs, which I think are very much in need. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Council members, any comment on that? Uh, Council member Colstead. I'd like to move approval of item 2L on the consent calendar. Second by Council member Mahan. Uh, Council member O'Neill. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know if the chief would be prepared to say anything tonight. I mean, I, I hate to admit that I don't know that much about this. I mean, I always assumed that these funds were like funds that were confiscated like during, you know, drug busts and things like that. So I, I don't know um, if, if, he, if he can speak to it at all as to um, how these seizures happen. For as long as I can recall, being in charge and also involved in asset seizure forfeiture. When funds are seized, they're then given, if it's a state level, it's given to our local district attorney's office, at which time a conviction has to be applied to the individual who was arrested and the funds were seized. Once it's been adjudicated, 
the funds are then released by the district attorney's office to the agencies and a percentage is given to the district attorney's office. Same thing for any federal task force that you belong to. You are notified and you have to see if you are eligible for those funds and the conviction has to apply. And that's what, before we can obtain and get any kind of seizure money, a conviction has to apply by the uh, individual. I mean, so somebody has to be convicted yes. and then their assets are permanently uh, Yes, but it's, we are not holding them and keeping them without the due process. It has to go through the district attorney's office or the judicial system. Okay, um, city attorney, do you look like you might want Yeah, the Fifth Amendment, uh, the Fifth Amendment or the Fourth Amendment that prohibits a seizure of property without due process. It's the Fifth Amendment requires due process. So these are these are both federal and state statutes that have due process requirements before the before the property could be could be seized by the government as a, as a you know a product of a crime. So um, I'm not sure what um, power the city could exercise o over these procedures. I mean, I, I suppose you could have someone look at it. I suppose you could have uh, people, pe people could look into it, but there's nothing we could do about changing um, state or federal statutes that, that govern the procedures for uh, um, uh, the, se the seizure of, uh, of assets. So it's like any time if somebody's arrested, if they have cash on them, it, they if cash. if if there's not, no, I don't think any time someone's arrested, no, it's not just that you have possession. the 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 property that is seized would would have to be something that that there was some kind of evidence that it was produced out of the crime. It's not it's not that I you know like if I'm walking down the street and get arrested for being drunk, they, they can't take they have to return the money after I get out of jail. It's not like that. That money is seized. Just simply, if you, if I if I'm incarcerated, it would be taken into possession, and then and then I'd receive it back. So, um, but if there's if there's for example, if if uh, drug dealers are busted with product as well as um, cash, then in that situation, it would look like the cash was a product of of the sale of the drugs, and in that situation, the cash would be seized. If there was a conviction, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but this is this is how I understand it to be. Um, then then there would be a procedure if if someone wanted to say, okay, well that that was my mother-in-law's cash that I just happened to have in a car and it wasn't really part of the crime. There would be a procedure for the person to to um, to to offer proof and and it would be adjudicated as to whether or not that 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 money would be forfeited to the government as assets as as a product of a crime or whether it should be returned to the rightful owner. So I, I mean, these are all statutes that the cities doesn't have any real control over. And, and I do apologize for not being clear. Any assets that are seized are, are proceeds from any illegal activity like narcotic sales. It's not just you have a, you just went to the ATM machine and had $200 and was arrested for drunk in public. We are not seizing that. It's involved in a criminal investigation and it's proceeds from that criminal activity is the reason. All right, thank you. Chief, thank can you. I ask you a question? Is it, are these funds generated from the city of Santa Clara? Are they state funds and we just get a share of, of whatever the, our proceeds may be? Is it a share of a larger pool or are they directly from the city? How does it work? Yes and no. So okay. locally, if our officers do an investigation and there's a, possession for sales or a sales investigation of illegal narcotics, and there's a large cash, potentially we can go through the seizure process, and the district attorney's office would process the seizure along with the criminal investigation. We do have a member involved uh, that's associated with the department, uh, DEA task force, and any investigation that they're involved in the San Jose task force, there is a sharing, um, we do share assets. Okay, Even though it's so it's not a combination. specifically our investigation, that's correct. So if we were to have an oversight group to look at it, it we're getting monies from different pots. From right now, we're getting from the, from the DEA task force, and then our own internal from the district attorney's office. Okay. So maybe it'd be better at the D, to talk to the DEA or something. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Colstad, did you have additional? 
Okay. Motion and a second on the floor. Is there any other um, comments? Hassan, would you like to make a further comment? Well, I, I thought my first one was why I was pulling it, and then now I get. Go ahead. Or is, that, is that okay? Okay. So, I mean, again, uh, <clears throat> if you need to take a motion on 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 the item for allocating those funds, those funds have already been seized. This isn't my 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 comments tonight are not about the funds that have already been seized because that has already gone through the process. My comment is that yes, there's legal proceeding. I I, I would urge the council to. Um, give direction to city staff to look into this f further to see what can be done as much as we can for citizen oversight over these funds. These are funds that are, as the chief just mentioned, are seized during regular police activity. Likely doesn't happen in Santa Clara that you have um, police officers that are illegitimately seizing stuff. I'm not suggesting that at all, but there are a ton of stories nationwide because again, this is based on federal law, where police, maybe they're racist, maybe they just have beef with the person that they're pulling over, and it is somebody's mother-in-law's money that they just, inheritance money that they just withdrew from the bank and are going to put it in theirs, and it's been seized, and it is, it is a nightmare to, to retrieve that through the legal process. Um, two years ago when I sent you guys the email uh, after speaking um, here in council, I also included a very informative um, uh, a link to a video that talks at detail, in detail length. I'm happy to send it to you guys again um, to look at what civil asset forfeiture has done to folks nationwide. What I urge is that Santa Clara take a leadership position and look at whatever we can, even if it's a little step in the process, to make it um, more fair for any residents who have had their assets seized um, with something as simple as a citizen oversight committee that reviews civil asset forfeiture cases and just, you know, the, the, police, the police would come and say, this was money collected during a drug bust, or this was money that was confiscated during a routine traffic stop, and at that point the committee can say, well, what happened in that traffic stop? Where do you think that money is coming from? It's not that the committee is going to serve, you know, judge, jury, and executioner, but they are there to give the citizens an easier way out than having to go through a lengthier court process. So again, my request is just to see what we can do. I don't know what the answer is legally, what we can or can't do. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. So the item on the agenda is to approve the appropriation of yes. what's already there. I would suggest you send us that information again, um, and we can look at putting it on a future agenda as a written petition. Okay? Yes. Maybe I can just shed a little light on this. The law that gives public officials the right to seize property is a state law. It's a statute that was voted on by the state legislature, signed by our governor. And the property has to be the instrumentality of a crime. It can't be a traffic stop. It, it's usually, I remember a few years back, uh, the Santa Clara Police Department pulled over a, a Rolls Royce that was full of heroin and money. And the Rolls Royce became the property of the city of Santa Clara. I don't think we kept it. I think we probably sold it and put the money in the general fund. But the, there are procedures. There are procedures that uh, people can um, can contest whether or not they're, they're property was seized uh, during a criminal investigation. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that SB 468 did not not pass both houses of the legislature and get signed into law. I'm also pretty sure that the League of Cal Cities would be notifying every city manager if there were a change in the asset forfeiture law. Cal Chiefs would be notifying all the police chiefs in the state if there were a change. This statute has been memorialized for years, and cities have been uh, legally seizing assets of criminals convicted of crimes. And um, I'm not sure what goes on in the rest of the United States. I can't speak to that. But in California, we have a pretty well administered and, and oversight of the asset forfeiture law. Uh, I see no reason 
for one of the 500 cities of California to try and change that law when there's been no hue and cry, uh, save this gentleman, that we change it. So I would, I would suggest we approve this agenda item and get the money into the finance department. And, um, you know, if the city wants to respond to this gentleman about the law, that's, that's fine. But I'm, I'm absolutely confident that it's being adhered to and it, it legally as well. There's a motion and a second on the floor to approve the asset seizure funds. There's no other discussion. Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously. Okay, next item we have is the public hearing general business. First is consideration of written petitions received. The first from Jerry Patrick Patrignani regarding a requesting a permanent built in clubhouse for the Santa Clara Lawn Bowls Club. Jerry, if you'd like to come forward. Is he not here? Let's see. All right, is there um, Okay, so it's a written petition to to agendize this. Set a future council meeting date to take action. Is there a motion to set a future date for action on this item? Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, I would be supporting that motion. That we uh, set this for a, uh, do you need a specific council date or city manager? We would be looking at um, August 21st or 28th likely. So we'll, um, once we get that firmed up and work with. Please let him know. The, right, the, long the goals, petitioner so. will we'll make sure that we have a good date that works for him. Okay, so there's a motion and a second on that. Is there any discussion on just the lawn bowls written petition? On the lawn bowls? Just the lawn bowls. Okay, this is for the written petition. It's not the second one, just the first one. Okay, just on the lawn bowls. Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously. Okay, the second item is a request by Teresa Sulcer requesting censure of council members Colstead and Mahan. If you'd like to come forward, Ms. Sulcer. So firstly, I'd like to thank you for including me on tonight's agenda. My petition to have a censure put in place comes from my belief that it is the responsibility of voting citizens to hold our elected officials responsible for their words and actions. To my mind, the censure process is a public record of when the council or a council member does not act in the best interests of the city and its residents. In our democracy, the role of the citizen is like that of a guardrail, creating an ample and a safe space for elected officials to work within. When these parameters are violated, it is our duty to speak up and object. This is how we best communicate that the work of the council reflects the will of the people. I would like to be clear that this request for a censure is specifically and only related to the events that took place at 1.30 a.m on the night of June 13th. I'm not going to take the time here to reiterate the many objections that I have to what happened at that meeting. My position is well documented and has been shared with Council several times already. However, I do want to state that this request for censure is in no way intended to diminish or render unappreciated the hard and good work done by Council members Mahan and Colstead over the many years that they have worked as public servants in the city of Santa Clara. Thank you for your time, and I hope that when this matter is resolved, we can all continue to work collaboratively and effectively together. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Davis. Um, did I, I just wanted to ask, um, are we going to do this, or is this just for our, our It really depends on, on 
what's the pleasure of the council in the event that um, there is interest in scheduling the item, the, I do want to make a presentation. In the event that there isn't any interest, there's no need for the presentation. Okay, so this was just for um, people to understand the process. Is, is, uh, is this what this was about? Okay, I was just curious as to why this was up here. Okay. Um, I also had, I wanted to hear if there was anyone else that had anything to speak on this. Otherwise, I would like to entertain a motion. So at the pleasure of the mayor, um, I'm seeing somebody up here. All right. Um, Miss Rosa, and then I have Suds Jane. And I don't know if there's any other cards after that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, my name is Dorothy Rosa, and I think this is such um, a serious thing that we should look at. <clears throat> I want to tell the city council that I do support the censure process. <clears throat> you need to be accountable for what you say or do. There are many people hurt by what the two of you did. Many people. It was absolutely the wrong thing to do. And you need to realize that. It was something underhanded. City Council knew not what you were gonna do which is, is wrong. It's an absolutely wrong thing to do. That's not what city council is about. You make a decision when you sit and listen to the people of Santa Clara, and then you vote. On a more personal note, I happen to know Pat and Patricia very well. Patty Mahon. I know them for a long time. They were such wonderful people. They were wonderful people. I don't know what has happened to them. I don't know. But this is certainly not the two that I remember. We need to stop all this nastiness and angry stuff that you keep holding and, and, and use it to vote no on everything. Just so you know, that's my feeling about this whole situation. I certainly agree that something should be done about the cen censure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jane? Welcome, sir. As the previous speaker said, we need to end this nastiness. I'm opposed to this censure. I think that it adds to the divisiveness and the nastiness. Now I'm gonna read something from Kevin Park because he couldn't be here. These are his words. While I understand the sentiment behind a desired censure against council members, Mahon and Kolstad, as one of the main people affected by their actions, as was I, I was here until 1.30 that night. <clears throat> I do not support this action, but just as during council seat appointment, I'm sure that a majority of council will disagree. Disagreement is a common thing that should be worked through, not punished. It is clear with every meeting that there is a disconnect within council. However, as with every relationship, it is rare that the problems are only on one side. I see no fewer than six sources at the dais and the hidden issues of the majority bullying and the inability to compromise make me worry about larger things, such as preservation and respect for our charter, infrastructure, and neighborhoods. But the public see only the politicking, which is why we see these reactions from the public. To be clear, we were found in violation of the California Voting Rights Act. The passing of Measure A would not have stopped that. An appointment in June would not have neg negated that, as that occurred after the guilty verdict. However, unpalatable the actions of council member may, members Mahan and Kolstad may be and have been, it was likely the best outcome considering where the decision was going. If we can focus on cooperation and the city issues at hand and stop the fifth grade bickering, perhaps we can serve the people better. That's Kevin Park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Please come forward. Yes. 
Heather, Anthony Becker. Um, I do not support this action, um, like Suds Jane just said, and Kevin Park. Disagreement is a common thing that should be worked through, not punished. We were uh, found, in the vi found in violation of the California Voting uh, Rights Act. The passing of Measure A would have never stopped that, like Suds and Kevin had said. An appointment to counsel would have never changed the outcome of that lawsuit. In fact, it would have just given somebody the incumbent advantage to run and make the districting even more complicated because of the incumbents. The fact that Caserta resigned and Council Member Colstead is termed out it is good that there is two open seats. Now, probably a couple new individuals can be elected, including those of diversity. However, many may think Mahan and Cole said's actions are wrong. I don't think they were wrong. I think they were right by letting the seat go to an election. This could have been a blessing in disguise for us. Many of us may not see it right now, but maybe 10 years from now, we will. That's why I think it is what's best for Santa Clara and it's power to the people, not power to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Howard Myers, uh, being Madam Mayor, Council Member, and staff. This isn't about different opinions. Several years ago, I served on the Charter Review Committee that redefined the provision allowing the council members to uh, select a replacement when there's a vacancy. Now, I promoted the portion of that that required a supermajority, thinking that uh, that would perhaps have more unity than a simple majority might provide. But it never occurred to me it would be this misused. That would be more understandable if the members had declared at the beginning of the meeting they would not be taking part in the vote for a replacement member. And even without an uh, explanation, it would have shown more respect for those applicants that were waiting, eager to serve the city. There might be some rationale for choosing not to vote. There is a provision in the charter that allows at 30 days, if you don't select a replacement, it goes to the next um, the next election, so I mean, just not voting or voting no, you know, it's, it's not a crime. But now as for the true motives, we're left guessing. Many of us think it might have been intended to strike back at fellow council members over some disagreement. Now, if that's the case, you didn't strike at them, you struck at us, the residents, that you're sworn to serve. Now, you didn't just prevent a volunteer from serving, you reduced the number of council members available to service, regardless of the reason for not voting, waiting until the end of the night is unforgivable and should be a and showed a complete disregard for others. That was mean and disrespectful. I think it is appropriate for the council to censor the two members, not just as a gesture of disagreement, but to let us, the residents, know that you also take it seriously. This isn't a matter of disagreeing or voting no. It's a matter of waiting until the end of the evening to say, oh, I'm not going to vote. Oh, no, no, that's not good. If you had just said so in the beginning, they wouldn't be here. Consideration, please. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. Welcome. Good evening, Chair. I'm Mayor and City Council members. See, I completely agree with Howard's statement. Um, I've uh, been here many times and seen, seen how um, uh, both Mann and uh, Colstead vote against the, the feelings of the residents. Their predetermined stance was by not voting for their replacement council member was obstructive and disrespectful to every member of Santa Clara. The candidates were put through the ringer for nothing. Both owe every candidate a personal apology for such a selfish act. Procedurally, the staff and candidates should have been notified not to put the candidates through their presentations. Frankly, censure is not severe enough. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Forward. Welcome, sir. Hassan Hagag here. I also was one of the people who was personally affected by what happened that night. I was here till 1.30 in the morning, um, like the other candidates that, were, uh, that had applied. Um, I had applied for other commissions before. <clears throat> uh, planning commission, I applied for it twice. It didn't get it. Um, and, and with every, every one of those applications, I got a letter um, from uh, the mayor and council office or the office of the mayor and council thanking me for my application. And in all of those, it was, it, it's always been on letterhead from the entire city council. 
Um, I did receive one, uh, a letter in the mail from the office of the mayor and council um, after applying for the vacant seat. And it had all the names of the current sitting council members thanking me for my application and wishing me to continue to stay engaged and involved in my city. And I looked at the top of the letterhead and I saw two names that shouldn't have been on there. I saw two names that should not have been on there because what the words that were in that letter thanking me for my time did not reflect what happened that night. This has nothing to do with whether or not we were gonna put that seat up to the voters in November. It would have gone up whether or not somebody was appointed. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with them voting no. They, have, they had every right to vote no. What it had to do with was playing the entire hall, playing all of us, pretending like that they were respecting the process when in the end they already knew that they weren't gonna pick anybody. That's disrespectful. I don't frankly know what a censure would do to these folks. I don't think it's gonna do anything. I would have loved to see their presentation to see whether censure has any teeth, but I don't think it does. So you may censure them. Um, I think maybe Howard brought up a good point that it shows to the rest of the community that you value and respect their time, but I don't really think it's gonna make a difference either way. So I, it doesn't matter to me whether you vote yes or no, because they're not gonna change their behavior and the slap on the face of the residents has already been done, so thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? <clears throat> All right, Council Member Davis. I wanna thank you all for your conversation. Um, it's obvious that this is definitely a serious issue to a lot of people in our community. They were very upset. A lot of people had things to say after the fact. But I think it's important that we respect our residents. And I think it's very important that we address this issue responsibly. So I want to put this in as a motion. Um, first, I would like to refer this censorship this to the governance committee to come back to the full council with a recommendation for a process at our next available meeting, which I think is August 21st, but I don't want to load that up. I don't know at the pleasure of what's, what's going on with that one. Second, I want to make sure that we remove the city manager and the city attorney from this process. Um, both of them represent us. We hire them, so they need to be out of this. This is not about them. Third, the governance committee will have to hire outside legal counsel to deal with this, but I would like this report to come back to the full council so that we can evaluate a process and the responsibilities for either a censure and or mon a monination. I'm sorry, I'm gonna say that wrong. A monination. Monishment, thank you. So with that being said, I think that we have to have our COO or someone else be a liaison within the governance committee to figure this out because I don't want either one of them engaged in that whatsoever because I want that part of my motion to be loud and clear that the city attorney nor the city uh, manager should be involved in this process. So I, I just want to be clear, um, I did have a presentation and it's my direct report should not also be involved in supporting this. Um, effort if this is the direction that the council wants to go in. What we can do is help procure um, services, independent services for the city council so that you have the resources that you need, but um, neither myself nor any of my direct reports should be involved. It's just a conflict of okay, interest. Okay, so or, we need to figure out some, uh, some type of administration. No, it's not a, it's not a conflict of it's, interest. It it's, it's, no, it's, I, I think both of us feel the same way. Okay. And that is that um, we serve all, all six of you. Right. And it, it you know, for, for us to have to um, be involved in, in, in assisting you with uh, judging two of the two of the six of you it, it's just a difficult thing and we would prefer not to but it's there is no legal conflict of interest here and so I think what we were, we're suggesting is that we will assist you in obtaining um, outside parties if, if you wish to um, uh, proceed with a uh, possible censure and um, you, you have a censure policy and I think the city manager is prepared to go over that and um, you could decide you know how you would like to proceed. 
um, in terms of setting something for, for a future date. Okay, and, and the other thing is that um, also to let the community know, the governance committee is an open committee. You can come there and say what you have to say, but at least we'll have the input of the community and then let the chair, which is um, council member O'Neill, sit through a process with three of us and also have community input. So um, I just hope that, that people will second this motion so that we can move forward with this and, and give the community due process. I hear what you're saying. Some people disagree with this, some people agree with this. But yes, there's a lot of people very upset in the community for various reasons. Um, but I think that we have to move forward with this and we have to be respectful and we have to have a process. We don't have one in place, but I think that I'm pretty sure we'll be able to find one. So that is the motion that I would like to put on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that, uh, Mayor, and and just add you know, that I support you know what uh, Councilmember Davis has just shared in terms of the uh, p policy and the steps that she has just uh, shared uh, in in terms of uh, using the uh, the governance committee and also um, getting uh, asking for outside counsel to assist us uh, with this process and also uh, looking to our chief operating officer uh, to help uh, with the, um, the process as well. Uh, so I will be uh, supporting the motion. Thank you. Council Member O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so this is an extremely difficult situation and um, you know, one of my mantras that I say to myself at different times during many days is, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers. And so I, in some ways I'm very hesitant to go for it because I, I, you know, we're all living the division of opinion that we have on the council. Um, and, you know, and as I weigh the comments back and forth, um, you know, the, one of the other candidates wrote um, a piece that was, you know, I'm sure a lot of us read it, that was in a blog that many of us see almost on a daily basis. Um, I am, you know, I'm also taking into account that Mr. Jane, and he read um, on behalf of um, Mr. Park, and that the fact that Mr. Hagog looks like he could go either way. Um, but I'm also very taken with some of the other comments by residents, by people who I, you know, are indicating that they were very affected, and the petitioner um, affected, even though they were not one of the candidates under consideration. Um, so, as I said, I, I, I'm hesitant because I want to see us try to um, really work together and work on behalf of the of the residents, and I myself too. If I uh, if, if I had, you know, if, the, if when the first motion that night came up, when you said, do we approve of the process, do we agree to go use this process, if the vote had been different at that time, I, you know, I would have maybe been a little irritated, but I wouldn't have been as angry as I was at 1.30 or quarter to 2 in the morning. Um, one of the things, uh, and I would like perhaps the, for the um, city manager to go through the information that before we vote, if that would be amenable to the council, so we have a better understanding. Um, and in the policy that we approved recently, there are other actions that could be considered. You know, there is the admonition um, or, you know, something else that could, that could happen to, you know, to formally register displeasure, you know, so, that, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's not just um, a censure, but perhaps, bef um, I don't know, Madam Mayor, do you think it's appropriate to perhaps have the, count, uh, the um, our city manager walk us through what the process would be before we vote? Yes, I'll go through the council comments first. Oh, okay, though. thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Mahan. Thank you. I, too, was going to ask for the city manager to put forth her presentation, which, because it wasn't in the agenda, it was post-meeting material. We all got it before the meeting, but it is important for the public to understand this process. Censure is for a violation of law. I also want to know, because we did adopt a censure policy, we adopted it on May 15th, 2018, and the, the policy is to put it on a council agenda, not to go to a committee. 
So I would strongly object to that process because it's not part of our policy and I'd like to see some justification for sending it to a, a committee beforehand because it involves an investigation and as a person that's being investigated, I have a right to know how that's being investigated and to participate in that. And I can't attend a governance committee meeting because it's limited to three, otherwise you violate the Brown Act because it's a committee meeting, not a public meeting, although it's publicly noticed. So either I would attend every meeting of the governance committee, putting us in the position of violating a Brown Act or having to make our governance committees a publicly noticed meeting and have it in a public meeting. Um, otherwise, you're violating my constitutional right to due process, which is what our censure policy is aimed at protecting. Censure may require, I'm reading directly, an investigation and must protect the due process rights of the council member because that's what's at stake here. It is a serious issue. I take it very serious, and it's serious to the, to the point where you can be censured for violation of a federal, state, law, our city charter, or our city policies. And I don't know how casting a vote that was in line with what many, many folks told me to do, which we had letters and letters saying, put this council's vacant seat out to a vote of the people, how that violates any city policy, charter, state, or federal law. So I would like to get some response, and it can't come from our city attorney. He has exhibited a, a deep personal bias. Actually, the members of the committee have exhibited a deep personal bias against me. So I don't see how that can be a fair process, how that can protect due process, and then before we make any action or send it to any com committee, I think we do need the opinion of an outside council on how we are set to follow our own censure policy that we adopted in May. Um, um, for the record, I do yes. not have a personal bias against the council member. All right, and I would say the same thing. And I would not. Okay. Um, City Manager, if you'd like to go ahead with the presentation, it was my understanding going to the Governance Committee was just to talk about the process, not I'll, to initiate, um, sure. not to yes. start investigating or taking public testimony on the charges. It was just to set up a, a fair and balanced process. But go ahead. So on uh, May 15th, the City Council voted unanimously uh, by adopting an admonition and censure policy by a 6 0 vote. I think it's important to first state as I go into this presentation, I wanted to make it very clear that given my direct reporting relationship, as the city attorney too is, is included in this comment, um, neither the city attorney nor I should be placed nor our direct reports in a compromised position of being involved in any action that may lead to discipline, investigation, or any other potential punitive action against a council member that we report to and serve as a member of the council. The city, myself and the city attorney, will remove ourselves from any involvement in these procedures to ensure professional neutrality and to be free from any actions that may give rise to a conflict or compromise position. And I think in, um, it's, it's mostly a compromise position where we both establish we would feel compromised in having to establish um, support for any of this effort. That said, I'll just review quickly the policy that is in place um, and then leave you with some considerations as you embark on the work. There is in the admonition process an informal admonition um, in the policy and it allows for any individual council member that can make an admonition of, at any council meeting during the public presentation or reports of members or special committees. That means at any point in time, the council, a council member can choose to admonish another council member for any action or, or disagreement. Any member of the city council or the public may submit in writing to the city clerk a request for an admonition concerning an alleged violation of law or city policy by another member. This is also included in um, your written policy, your written petition policy where a member of the public may submit an action as you have already addressed this evening. 
For purposes of noticing admonition, um, as I mentioned earlier, the first and foremost is nothing in the policy shall preclude an individual council member from making public statements regarding such alleged conduct at any time during a meeting. Um, however, um, if it is on the agenda, the city clerk's publication, legal noticing and distribution of the city council agenda and related documents, if available, shall serve as sufficient notice to the council member subjected to the allegations. For admonition, there's no scheduling as required. However, if we do have council policy 030, that um, is the written petition policy which for which the procedures are outlined in um, your packet. Procedures, if it's not approved, the item is, um, is therefore no longer pursued. The matter is closed and not appealable. If it is approved, um, then the council may choose to issue an admonition prior to any findings or facts regarding the allegations, either verbally or by resolution. And because the admonition serves as a warning or reminder, the city council is not required to conduct an investigation or a separate hearing to determine whether the allegations are true or not. For censure process, in this case, which um, a written petition has been submitted, you should first handle it as, um, as a written petition policy because that's exactly what's on your agenda to schedule it or not. Um, I do think it's important that um, I state that your written policy did not include procedures which provides for transparency around the steps that the city council can take. And so um, I just want to bring to your attention that the city council must establish procedures for ensuring due process. Council should establish its structure for completing this work for public disclosure and approval. And I would suggest that um, part of your structure could be handling the matter as a whole city council, issuing a subcommittee to um, target work or things of that sort. It's, it's it, you basically have whatever um, other opportunities you do when you do sp special focus on items available to you. Um, council should commission an independent consultant to support council with assembly materials needed to conduct a center hearing. Separate work and findings is needed for each council member. We, you guys would need to work with independent council for um, each of the allegations against each council member. The step may require multiple meetings and should be completed before any center hearing. I do want to make it clear because I, I, it's come up several times as, in terms of um, how it's stated. Um, I will be away for um, for a period of time, and at the and as the acting city manager Walter Rossman will serve um, to support the council on any consultant or procurement needs that you may have. However, he is not going to be a staff support for this because of the conflicts or the compromise position that we stated. So there, you would need your own independent. Um, liaison and resource, but Walter can certainly help with procuring contracts for that purpose. For noticing, a copy of the complaint and request for censure shall be provided to the named council member as soon as possible following receipt, but in no event less than 72 hours prior to the item being considered by the council. That's a required step in your policy. An independent council will be able to um, advise you what's the appropriate time to issue that notice likely upon completion of a certain volume of work for which there exists the, um, the material facts to issue notice. And then from there, with procedures publicly approved, work completed by an independent um, consultant, the center hearing should be scheduled and required noticing should be issued. And this too may take multiple steps depending on how you're advised. I do have some considerations for you as, as you think about going forward with independent uh, consultants and um, the council should decide on outside legal counsel as well as resource staff resources or resources um, and ask the following questions. I say this because in each of the cities that I worked for there have been censure um, activity and these are common questions that are regularly answered first and so I'm just passing this along to you. Um, the council can the council member subjected to the allegations participate in the vote on the process to establish procedures, what conflicts of interest may exist, can the council member subject, subjected to the allegations participate in a, in a vote of his or her admonition or censure, 
and then any other legal analysis that surfaces during your work. So those are items that um, traditionally come up during this work and, and would, be need, would need to be addressed as part of your um, procedures process. Okay, are there any questions from the council? I'll go here from the written petitioner and then um, Vice Mayor Watanabe. Yes, please come forward. I guess my understanding about the censure procedure was a way of residents giving feedback that the council was acting in the best interests and doing the will of the people. Now, having a censure procedure that's going to derail the council and become more of a conflict of interest doesn't really serve the purpose for anybody. But I do think we need in our city some way that we can accurately document when residents do not feel that the best interests of the city has been served. Maybe the admonition policy is a better policy right now. It seems a little ridiculous that a city that's more than 100 years old doesn't have these things in place and ready to go. So I certainly think some time and effort should be put in place figuring out how the council can get accurate feedback and that reflects what you are doing is actually what the people want done. And I think that's lacking in our city right now. And I think what happened at that particular council meeting was really unacceptable. Um, so probably the censure seems like if it's got a lot of legal attachments, it's maybe not the appropriate measure and an admonishment might serve the purpose right now. Thank you. Uh, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Watanabe. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your statement, Ms. Salser. Uh, the city does have an admonition and censure policy, which was just implemented in April of this year. Um, we've never, since I've been on the council, um, had it necessary to use it. And because you brought your petition, uh, you made your statement and you've, you prepared a statement and brought it before the council, um, it, it's, this is really the first opportunity. So actually, um, it's why it, it's never, nothing is in place. We have a policy, but we've never had to use it. So this is the first opportunity. Um, I uh, know I, I just uh, seconded uh, Council Member Davis's uh, motion. However, uh, I don't know if we can, if, uh, based on what you're saying, because you are the petition maker, as a result, uh, do we need to change our motion because you're now stating something different than what you originally wrote in your petition? So uh, I will, um, I, I don't know if we can, we can change that now uh, and, and, and change the motion or, uh, or. What are you suggesting? Uh, do you, uh, do you, or would you consider, I mean, you're the maker of the motion, uh, Council Member Davis, so uh, I, I think you should be the one to make that decision. I seconded it, but you were the maker of the motion. I can address Teresa. So no, you're addressing us. Okay, I'm addressing you. Okay. Um, I hear what you said, Teresa. I can still have my opinion. Um, if that's what you wish, after what you've just heard, then I can change the motion to just go for admonishment versus the censure, if that is what you're comfortable with. But I also think that um, you, it, yeah, it was, it was your petition. No one else came up and did this. So at the will of the council, okay, I will change my motion to reflect what you're asking because this was yours. So I will change my motion for admonishment versus the central policy and uh, give you what you wish to have because you felt very strongly about this at 1.30 in the morning along with four other of us sitting up here right now. So I will change the motion to admonishment versus the central policy, but still continue with the process. 
if that's okay with the rest of the council. Uh, yes, I'm will I'm willing to accept okay. that. Yes, thank you. May I, may I say something? Okay, we got a motion on the floor. Uh, so I can I have, as a point of order, I'm I'm not sure. So is the motion now to begin a process to or just admonishment? To, a process to investigate an admonishment. You don't need to investigate admonishment. Yeah, there's I mean, no admon due process attaching to an admonishment. Because I mean, that's what I just wanted. Because so the, the policy, the, the, this the policy that was being described by the city manager would be for a censure. So if we go back to the, can we go back to the first slide? Madam Mayor. Are you finished, Councilmember? Yeah, so, okay, Count so we're talking about a process. We're to talking about a process, a process um, to now to for to admonishment. Do. Council Member Mahan. Thank you. Actually, our policy has pretty well laid out an admonishment procedure as well because there is no real procedure needed. An admonishment may be directed to all members of the city council, you know, re, uh, as the policy says, reminding them that a particular type of behavior is in violation of the law. So if, as a council as a whole, we're about to do something that was wrong or unlawful or violated our charter or our policies, the city attorney could admonish us, or another council member could admonish us as a whole not to take a certain action. Beyond that, the policy allows individual council members to make an admonishment at any council meeting at any time uh, against any particular council meeting. No investigation, as the slide shows, no, um, no legal proceedings, no censure. I feel that we, council member Polstad and I, took the admonishment of our fellow council members the night of that hearing, which was June 12th through the 13th, and the admonishment of many people that were here that night. I would like to say sincerely that I'm sorry. I really regret that it caused such, I don't even know the word, uh, such a reaction, provoked such a, a response. And for many people, it was a very deeply emotional response, and I understand that. You may recall that when we first started the whole process of trying to fill former council member Caserta's seat. My first motion was to put it out to a vote of the people because we had gotten so many letters, and I have them here, saying the vacant seat should go to a vote. Let us decide. People I talked to on the street, people who called me on the phone, people who emailed me personally, all said the same thing. It's close to an election time. We want our right to vote. We don't think an appointment is appropriate. I, I'm telling you, I got so much. That was the input I got from the public. Now, I understand that the public who feels that we should have made an appointment, your point of view is just as legitimate. But so is the point of view of the, all of the people who were putting pressure on us to put this vacant seat out to an election. I said, Council Member um, O'Neill said something that struck me and stuck with me when we first, did, so my motion to put it out to an election failed. And then the motion was to establish a procedure to fill the vacancy. And Council Member uh, O'Neill said something at the very end. She said, maybe there'll be someone we can all agree on. And that stuck with me. And so when the council decided on the procedure to fill the vacancy, of course, this is a democracy, you do what the majority wills. So Mr. Kolstad and I followed the will of the majority of council and we participated in the process to the full extent that I could. I read every letter, I looked at every application, I listened to every interview, as we all did. At the end of the day, there was no one candidate that we all agreed on. If you look at the history of the votes, the way it was, the way it was ranked and all of that, there was nobody that we all agreed on. So we went through a process of elimination. And when we got to the end, 
And Mrs. Rosa, I'm really sorry that I disappointed you more than anybody else because we've worked hard together on a lot of initiatives, including the 49er Stadium, and I've always had the greatest respect for you. Um, and I'm not trying to make excuses or justification. I'm just saying that this is what happened and this is the way it happened. At the end of the day, the top, I think it was a top three or four people that got four votes or three votes, I'm sorry, three people that got four votes. We went down the list and they all failed four to two. And I thought that was the end of it because that's what we had agreed that we would vote for only those that got a majority of the council votes to begin with. But nonetheless, we continued down the line and went to those candidates that got three votes each, all except for the last candidate who never was put into nomination at that last go round. And that candidate happened to be my number one choice. And had that nomination but been put forward, being my first choice, perhaps I would have continued and, and voted for that candidate. But we'll never know because we never got to that last candidate in that last go round of voting. So again, I do apologize for the backlash, for the chaos, even for some of our own staff members um, being provoked into saying things that night that I really felt, you know, they were personally very hurtful, but we're up here to take the shot, so I have to put that aside. So if there are individual council members who wish to admonish us, then let us do it now. Let us do this, let us get it done. Um, if the council wishes to proceed in general, to get a censure procedure to go along with our policy, fine, send it to the governance committee as long as it's not inherently aimed at a censure hearing against any individual council member. And if that's the case, then I don't think the city attorney does have to recuse himself. It's just general procedure that we're doing. So Ms. Seltzer, if that's your wish, and I respect it, and I do appreciate that Perhaps now you have a greater understanding of what censure means, because censure would mean that you, there would have to be an investigation by an independent counsel. I, of course, would have and do have my own attorney, so would Mr. Kolstad, because we have a right to defend ourselves, and their counsel would have to make a finding that we violated a law or the charter or city policy. And I don't think in our exercising our right to vote the way a majority of people had asked me to vote violates any of that. Ms. Sulcer, no, we're not going to have this at the moment. Okay. We're going down the council. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Colstead. Thanks, Mayor. I, um, I appreciate the remarks by uh, Teresa Sulcer that an admonition might be more appropriate here. Um, I'm not going to regurgitate this whole thing uh, and make a long speech. I just want to say that um, I, I did agree with something Pat Patricia Mahan said about feeling that I had been duly and truly admonished on the 13th of June by my council colleagues. They were clearly disappointed in my conduct and my vote, and I completely get that. Um, I was also, um, I, I thought it was refreshing that Kevin Park and Suds Jane and, and Anthony Becker all um, spoke about, and uh, Sam Hagag, they all spoke about putting this behind us. And I think that's appropriate. And um, if, I, I will support the motion uh, for an admonition, uh, if, that, if that's uh, appropriate, if that's what the council wants, just so we can put this behind us and get about the city's business going forward. So um, I'm sorry I disappointed you. I, uh, I felt that I was voting my conscience when I did it. And, um, but I clearly understand your feelings. So uh, if that's the motion, I will support it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make some comments because based upon the testimony that I just heard from um, Councilmember Rahan and Councilmember Colstead, it just reminded me of that evening and what happened, not to the council, because we have 
our disagreements and we don't, you know, we, we have differences of opinions on a lot of things. But I think the, the, the core of this issue is how the public and the candidates for the seat were treated. And that's what we're talking about. Not anyone's right to make a decision here or there or vote this way or that way or select this candidate or that candidate. It was strictly how the candidates were treated and taken through a process that led to nothing at the end and whether or not that was premeditated uh, to take those, those candidates. It, it just reminded me of that evening and, and, and I see at this point that there's no acknowledgement of the harm that was done to those candidates by these two council members. I, I don't see any remorse in the, the process that they engaged in, that they voted on, that they went ahead with. And then at the end of the day, when council member Mahan said, oh, there was a candidate that was my first choice but was never put up, but she never made the motion to put that candidate up when we all had the opportunity to do that. Neither did Councilmember Colstead. And so I, I would suggest to the council that we move ahead with an admonishment hearing with an option to have a censure based upon the testimony that we receive from the public. Because I don't know about the rest of the council members up here, but that action of that evening en enraged many members of our public that know that we're looking at that uh, Ms. Sulcer's written petition was coming forward and that they would have an opportunity to speak their mind about how the public was treated, not the council or not our issues or not the way we vote, but how the public was treated. And they want some sort of a closure on this. And so whether it's, uh, you know, there was admonishment, yeah, well, there was outrage. I'll call it, I'm not going to call it, I'm going to call it outrage at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning when I saw the faces of those candidates who were put up to a vote, five candidates, very successful, very qual well-qualified candidates were turned down one, two, three, four, five in a row. Um, there's been a lot of information coming forward that this potentially was premeditated and people want their right to speak. So I'm sorry, but when those kinds of actions are taken against our public, there needs to be some response by this council. Fortunately, we have our new admonition and censure policy that we put in place for council member Caserta, which we didn't have to use because he resigned. Uh, but this policy allows us to have an admonition hearing and uh, with, I, I would like the maker of the motion to consider an admonition hearing with a option to censure, if necessary, to set up a censure policy, a censure hearing after that, after hearing the admonition hearing. There may be some information we hear at that meeting that would like, that would compel us to take it even further. So I don't think there needs to be much for an admonition hearing. We can just set a date if I understand that correctly. And then we don't have to set up the resources uh, except that we would need not our city staff to be um, staffing that, but um, maybe a separate council to help us help us with that. You, you, you don't need a separate hearing. You could, you could take an admonition tonight. There's no yes. due process. Well, there's hearing. members of the public that would like to speak. You can, you're, so. you're free to, to continue this to another time. Then I would recommend that we continue uh, and put it on the agenda for an admonition hearing on the first meeting that we come back in August. So because this is under the written petition policy, then um, you should take an action to schedule a, a hearing for purposes of admonition, and then you can proceed from there. And that's what the I item recommend. on the agenda is a written petition policy, and that's the matter. And based you. on what we hear at that meeting, the option uh, to continue to a censure if necessary. Can I ask a question, City Attorney? What if we have this? Okay, if we schedule this um, to the twenty-first, what would trigger a censure? You know, what would, what would be the trigger 
The, the only the admonishment is one thing, but what triggers it to the censure if this is going to be in an open forum? That's what I need to understand. A, cen a censure would be if, if you, okay, so this, the, the policy that you enacted, and I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about theoretically, the policy you enacted for an admonition, it's just simply saying, basically, I think you did a bad thing. Um, you don't need any due process for that. You can individually do that or take a vote to do that. You can do that tonight or you can do that at a future hearing. Um, so there's no real due process for an admonition. If you want to actually formally censure somebody, that means you have to make some kind of factual finding that, the, that, that there was a violation of the law or of a city policy. So, um, so that's why you need to give the, the person who is the object of the censure you need to give them due process rights because they need to know, number one, what day you're going to do this. There'll be a hearing. They need to know that there's a hearing. And so they need a date and time, and they need to know that that censure is a possibility during that date and time. And if you want to be able to make a finding that there was a, a policy violation or a um, violation of the law, then you might want some assistance from um, uh, outside counsel to help you determine whether, whether that had happened or not. There doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of factual, in this case, a tremendous amount of factual investigation you might need, but you might want to have someone at least look at that and, and give you any kind of advice they, they might want to give you about what facts might, might I need to know to advise you on whether or not there's a, there, was a, there was a violation of the, of the law or um, a policy. So they would look at your policies, they would look at the law, they would look at the facts, they would give you some advice, the public could testify, and then you'd have the potential to say, we want to formally pass either a resolution or a formal city action of censure of, of uh, another council member. So it's a formal process with due process, or it's an informal process with no due process, but the word you use is admonish as opposed to censure. So if I change my motion again, so I would like to have maybe an admonishment hearing set for August 21st. So the due process would be the people that didn't come here tonight that want to speak in the, within the community for or against will have that opportunity to do that instead of doing it this evening. That way we follow some kind of due process. And if it does from testimony trigger if someone comes up and says, I know this was done premeditated, that would trigger the censure process. So, um, um, am I understanding you correctly? I, I can't give you an opinion okay, on, on whether right. premeditation so let me has just anything change to my do motion. with anything. Okay, so let me just change my motion to move this admonishment, um, listening to Teresa Shelter's request to August 21st, so that the public has an opportunity to come and we'll just deal with this at another time so that it is publicly noticed, people understand what's going on, they can all have their say, and that way we can put this behind us and move forward with, uh, with the process, but also move forward with our lives. So um, I would like to make that motion to move it to the 21st for admonishment, and if something does come out of that, then we will proceed at that particular point. Does that cover it, city attorney? It's a motion. Is there a second? Yes. Second it. Okay, motion second. Council Member O'Neill. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, so it, the mayor said some of it about um, thinking about that night. And because when we were making the motions, Council Member Davis made the first one, which I seconded. And then when I it took, I guess I'm slow sometimes. It took me a while to catch on. So I started going down the list because I really thought any of those, the, the five that we mentioned would serve very much most ably. And I might have a difference of opinion with um, Commissioner Becker about whether that would have had any impact if we had appointed um, uh, someone from one of our um, underrepresented or not represented communities to the council. But... Um, so I was kind of, after I went through the five that, um, that I, I, well, or I decided to stop, I was kind of like waiting to see 
is, is somebody else was going to nominate or, you know, um, make a motion for anybody, somebody else. And then that's when it really, really clicked in when there was no other motion. Um, so uh, I, as I said, I, I, I don't want to make this suck up too much energy in the, in the, with, with considering how many other things we have going on, but um, if we're at this point talking about an admonishment, unless there's some other evidence that presents itself to raise this to the level of censure, that I'm willing to, you know, have some uh, an agenda item where, and perhaps, um, you know, some, uh, you know, wording could be presented, or you know, uh, for a formal admonishment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure things have not been comfortable for Council Member Mahan and Cole's dad since this happened, but I'm, I, I too remember the looks on the faces of the people in the audience that night, and that was um, uh, something I will not soon forget. So I, based on the motion as it's currently formulated, I will support that. Thank you. Council Member Mahan. Thank you. And where does the investigation come in? Because an Public speaking um, is not an investigation, and censure can only be agendized for a hearing and scheduled for a hearing after an investigation and a formal resolution based on findings of fact that we, in fact, violated a law or charter or council policy. Where does that come in under this motion? Certainly a censure hearing can't be founded upon public testimony. I, I would recommend that if, during the admonishment hearing, if anything presents itself, that the council feels um, necessary to set up a censure hearing, it wouldn't be that evening. It would be following the um, censure policy and it would be set at a later date. I'm not talking about the hearing. I'm talking about the investigation. When would that occur, city attorney? Because uh, if people, it, 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 we're just, the first part is fine, you know? The first part is fine. but. And that's all at this point that the written petition is now asking for. It's, it's up to the council to decide, um, not for all due respect, the written petitioner at this point. It's a and if decision. the council wants to censure, then they have to do the investigation process, make a formal resolution, make findings of fact that there's been a violation of law, and present that to myself and Council Member Kolstad before a censure hearing can be set. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And the council has not made that determination at this point, but we reserve the right to do that during the admission hearing if necessary. Then it doesn't need to be necessary. part of this motion. It's inappropriate to make that second part of the motion. Well, the council always has an option for the And center. by the way, I'm very comfortable with what I did. You can't imagine how many people have thanked me that they were so anxious to have an election for this vacant seat. Well, Councilmember Mahan, we're not thanking you at this point, and there was going to be an election in November, and I think that's why we should consider taking official action because we have this policy that allows either, either admonishment or censure, and um, it sends a message to our community that we are not going to operate like this. So we're very happy that you're happy with your decision. But the way that the community was treated that evening, um, I personally am not happy or proud. And I think it was another stain on Santa Clara. And, uh, and I think it's important that we take some kind of official action. So uh, Vice Mayor Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. No, uh, I'm, I'm getting the impression that uh, Councilmember Mahan would like to uh, frame this as a policy dispute, and that's not what we're upset about. Um, we're upset about what happened with the community and the participants in the uh, application that applied uh, for the open seat that night. What happened that night, it was a deceptive way uh, in how things were done. It was unprecedented, and it's why we should consider an official action. We have a policy that allows either censorship or admonishment, and I'll support agendizing a vote on admonishment because it sends a message that this is not the way we should operate. An admonishment hearing allows people who haven't spoken out to be able to do so, and I think that's very important. Uh, I think uh, I'm 
what happened that evening. I mean, I heard things from Councilmember Kolstad prior to the meeting, which gives me concern as to how that this may, that this was premeditated. And, and to hear uh, the comments uh, being made by uh, Councilmember Mahan, frankly, uh, come across as frankly uh, flippant. And, and, and I think it's a very, uh, I mean, if somebody wants to show um, uh, a compassion and and uh, and, and an apology, um, you know. Uh, stick s stick by what you say. Don't start saying that that's not what you meant, because you, this is a very serious charge. It's never been brought before, and it's being brought now. And I think that raises to a level of how the seriousness of the action and the fact that a member of the community felt that it was necessary to file a petition to take action as a result. And so it's why I support this the, the motion to go ahead with an admonishment and see at that hearing, an admonishment hearing, and see at what level, you know, uh, that that hearing will bring things to and whether or not it's necessary to go forward with uh, with a censure. All right, any other comments? We have a motion and a second on the floor. Please register your vote. And that passes four to one with one abstention. All right, we're gonna take a five minute break. Thank you. A nice party going on. There's a big party going on at Tablands. Look at John Moss. 